Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by GMHBA and the Barwon Infant Study. Today we'll be talking about what you can do before, during and after pregnancy for a healthier baby. My name is Tina Campbell and I'm the co-facilitator today and in a moment I'll introduce you to Yvette Deming from GMHBA. But before I do that, I'd just like to quickly run through a couple of things. We will have a quick look at the, uh, excuse me, the slides are not changing. We'll have a quick look at the control panel. So you have a control panel in front of you. Um, you'll see that you are muted and um, the, excuse me for a second, you are muted. Um, you, we can, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Um, you can actually ask the panel members a question by putting up your hand, but in fact the best way to ask a question if it's an interactive session is to type your question into the field just at the uh, bottom there. So just, in fact, you can um, have a bit of a practice run at that if you want to, just type into that field and hit submit and we will receive your question. And Anna, who is in the background there, will actually ask the panel members um, the questions as we run through. But there'll also be about 10 minutes at the end of the session to ask questions. There's one other um, point to discuss and, and very quickly mention, that is that the information in this webinar is designed to complement the information provided by your doctor and healthcare team. It's, not, it's information that's provided for general education purposes only. It is general in nature and some of the information may not necessarily apply to you. So you should always follow the specific recommendations made by your doctor or other healthcare professionals. So I'm pleased to introduce Yvette Denning from GMHBA who will now facilitate the rest of the session. Thanks Yvette. Thank you Tina. Welcome everyone to our webinar. Um, I'm one of the health and wellness coordinators here at GMHBA in Geelong. We also have Anna in the background and she'll be monitoring the questions from our audience. And as you said, we'll um, discuss those questions at the end. We're proud to support the Bowen Infant Study and we're excited to be partnering with them today to bring you this webinar. Whilst you might know GMHBA as a not-for-profit health insurer, we actually pride ourselves on using innovative initiatives to improve the health of our staff, our community and our members. Today is a real practical example of this in action. So thank you for logging on to learn about such an interesting topic today from our wonderful panel of experts who are Associate Professor Peter Vullerman, Dr Marilla Druitt and Karen Binks. So let's get started by introducing our first presenter. Associate Professor Peter Vullerman is a general paediatrician from Barwon Health in Geelong and the Deakin University School of Medicine. Peter is the lead investigator on the Barwon Infant Study and he has a real interest in exploring what causes allergies and asthma in the early years of life and particularly how the environment, diet and the organisms in the gut of mothers and babies might influence this. Over to you Peter. Thanks Yvette. And thank you everyone who's, um, who's joined us this afternoon. It's a nice day, cold but sunny. Um, so I thought I'd just tell folks a little bit about the Barwon Infant Study, um, which is a, a big project that really belongs to the Barwon community. We've um, recruited 1,074 beautiful babies and their mums and dads um, into the project over a three year period. And the, um, the kids in the study are now just starting to turn four years of age. Um, and we've done this project's a, a collaboration between um, Barwon Health, Deakin University, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and we're very, um, very pleased and, and thankful to have the support of, of GMHBA. Um, so this in the back, if I can just go to the next slide. Um, the context for the Barwon Infant Study is that the modern environment's brought all sorts of fantastic health benefits and in particular a, a really dramatic reduction in a whole range of infectious diseases. But over the same sort of course of history, we've started to see um, an increase in a range of non-infectious immune related conditions. So this is things like um, asthma and allergy, but also type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease. And we're also seeing a, a, an increase in a range of other non-communicable diseases that you might not necessarily immediately associate with 
inflammation, but which are in fact associated with inflammation. So these include cardiovascular disease, type um, 2 diabetes, mental health problems. So if I can go to the next slide, please. Um, and if you look at this whole range of, of non-communicable diseases that have become much more common in the modern world and you were to look for a unifying feature, that feature arguably would be inflammation and it's become more and more apparent that this predisposition to inflammation is, um, is likely to be programmed very early in life. Um, that is during the baby's um, formation in, in, during the pregnancy and during early infancy. Um, and in order to look into this and try and understand this process better, the world needs studies that combine a whole lot of data about the modern environment with the collection of a whole lot of biological samples from the mothers and the babies, um, as well as careful measurement of clinical phenotypes, clinical outcomes among, among the babies. Go the next, thanks. So the, the, the Barwon region is a fantastic place to do this and that's for a number of reasons. First is up until very recently we've had a single paediatric and obstetric service that basically services the complete community and we, we, we all get along very well, don't we Marilla? So, uh, and that's been really important because it's, it's allowed us to recruit people into the study and it's also meant that the, the midwives and the obstetricians have, been, have done a superb job in collecting the biological samples for us. Um, so we've had, there's some 3,600 births in the Barwon region uh, each year and um, and all of those um, occur at either the Geelong Hospital or St John of God, um, or virtually all of them. So the, the thing that's really unique about the Barwon Infant Study is not so much the 1,074 participants, it's the depth of biological samples that we've collected. So we've got a whole range of different samples from blood, faecal samples, nasal swabs, urine, hair, breast milk, placenta. Among the most important are the paired blood and faecal samples from both the mother and the baby because that allows us to look at the interaction between the microorganisms in the mother and the baby's gut and the developing immune system. Next slide please. Um, we have a whole range of different clinical outcomes that we're looking at am among these kids. So we've looked at lung function by um, uh, uh, various techniques right from um, early infancy in these babies. We've looked at cardiovascular development, so the thickness of their um, artery walls. Uh, we've looked at uh, allergy by doing skin prick allergy testing and, and then among the kids who were skin prick allergy tested we invited them to come into the hospital and we did an actual formal food challenge and delineated 61 children who have challenge proven food allergy at a year of age. Um, we've looked at the kids' activity levels. This little guy over on the right of your screen who happens to be my son is wearing an accelerometer which the kids have worn for a week to give us good exercise and activity data. And we've looked at neurodevelopment. So we've done neurodevelopmental testing when the kids are two years of age. That's the, the little bloke in the middle down the bottom and then the little one in the tent is doing a test at four years of age looking at executive function which is a, um, a, a precursor to um, ADHD and related conditions. We're just starting to publish a lot of the outcomes from the project and I'll just very briefly take you through some work we've been doing. This is a paper with a great big long title but essentially what we showed was that children who go on to develop food allergy are born with immune systems that over respond. So we pulled out some of the um, cells from the core blood, if you go to the next slide please, where we went back to the core blood samples, we pulled out a particular type of cell called monocytes and we stimulated them and the, the FA on the, bottom, um, on the bottom axis of these figures is the food allergic groups and what we found is that on average the food allergic kids produce more inflammatory cytokines at birth long before they actually developed food allergy. Next slide please. Peter, um, a few participants are wondering, are they able to join the Bowen Infant mm. Study? No, we we, we um what we the recruitment period finished uh, some years ago. We have got other projects that are underway. Um, in so we've got two re related projects. One is a project called India, which is looking a similar project to Biz, but is looking at um, type one diabetes specifically. So this is families where there's a mother, brother, 
um, father or sister with type 1 diabetes, whether, where they're expecting a baby, we'd um, love to have them involved with the project. We also have another study called the Miss Bears study, which is looking at BCG vaccination in the first week of life for allergy prevention. People are welcome and we'd love to have them involved in the, um, the work that goes on in the Barwon Infant Study, but in terms of actually being participants in it, the, the, the cohort's now complete. Um, so these, these data here I'm showing you are, um, go to some of the microbial effects that we've found and essentially what, that, what they show is that um, if you've got, if we take our baseline group as families that have no pets or livestock and we say that their, their risk of developing food allergy is, is one, the children who come from families with a pet and most of those families it's a dog, their, their risk is about, um, is less than half of, uh, of, of the families without, food, without animals of developing food allergy. And the families who have livestock, and most of those families have pets and livestock, so they have a lot of microbial exposure, their, their risk of developing food allergy is less than a quarter of the, uh, of the children without early life animal exposure. Next slide please. And we've been interested in trying trying to work, look at how, whether this microbial exposure relates to this cord blood signature that we've, we've identified and what we've found is that if you look at the ratio of a nace to adaptive immune cells, so um, one measure of in, inflammation, if you've got less microbial exposure during pregnancy, you tend to have a lower ratio. So it's as almost as though you have a less stimulated immune system. It goes up a bit if you've got pets, it goes higher again if you've got livestock. Next slide, please. Similarly, we looked at sibling numbers. So the two most um, reproducible findings in allergy research are that pet and livestock exposure are protective and that having more siblings are protective. And when we looked at this ratio of, an, of innate to adaptive immune cells, we saw that if you had no siblings, you had a lower ratio and then for each sibling on average that ratio went up. So this sort of goes, we think, to the hypothesis that if in the modern environment perhaps children are being born with a relatively understimulated immune system in utero which then paradoxically is hyper responsive. Next slide please. So we've got my, our first poll um, now if, you'd, if you wouldn't mind putting that poll up for me Yvette. So the question is have you considered the relevance of weight management to pregnancy? So this is a heading off in a, in a, in a slightly different direction. Um, and I think you'll find this is a bit of a theme of the webinar. We're each going to be um, touching on, on this topic in, in one way or another. So I'm not sure if the results are starting to come in on that. One of the reasons where we're all interested and, and, and paying more attention to weight management is that as I think most people will be aware, um, overweight and obesity has become a much bigger issue in Australia and many parts of the world. Fantastic. So the results are coming through and it's, um, it, it, what this tells us is that um, the vast majority of people, 80, uh, over 80% 80 of um, folks attending the webinar have thought about weight management in the context of pregnancy and that's terrific. Um, it's important because you know, d the data from America suggests that almost half of women in their childbearing age years um, are now in the overweight um, or above range and there's more and more data coming out to tell us that this may have implications both for the mum and for the baby. So from the mum's point of view we know that um, there's a, we've found in biz that there's a relationship between the mum's body mass index which is her weight divided by her height squared um, and the um, level of inflammation both during, uh, during pregnancy and at the time of the birth. Next slide please. And similarly we've found that there's a relationship between the mum's level of inflammation and the baby's level of inflammation at birth and also I haven't got the data to sh shown here but a relationship between the mother's body mass index before pregnancy and the baby's inflammation at birth. What this goes to is the idea that the, the combination of being uh, of excess um, adiposity or fat and inflammation can be in a sense inherited passed on to the baby and what the animal models suggest us 
suggest is that there can be an intergenerational increase in this combination of um, increased adiposity and increased inflammation. We don't know what the health implications of that may be, but it's another good reason to think about weight management. So I might hand over to the next speaker, um, but I'd be delighted to answer any questions at the end of the webinar if people have them. Actually, um, oh, sorry. Just, just go no, to I've your last slide, slide and I've... just summarise it all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> just trying to synthesise all of that into something that's useful. Um, the microbiome research is in its early stages and there's going to be a whole lot of data that's going to come out over the next decade because it's a really hot topic. I think it's really likely though that after a whole lot of research currently is done, we're going to come back to some simple principles that are already apparent now, which is that the things that are likely to be good for the organisms in your bowel are that it's good to have a, a lifestyle similar to your great 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 grandmothers and have lots of exposure to animals and livestock but using common sense not not if the animals are sick particularly sick cats who can carry um, conditions that are, are not good for pregnancy a Mediterranean type diet is good for your microbiome so that's in particular that's a diet that's high in vegetables and pulses things like lentils and chickpeas and avoiding the unnecessary use of antibiotics is good for your, uh, for your microbiome and sometimes you need antibiotics but I think generally they there's a sense that they are perhaps overused um, and in terms of thinking about weight management, which uh, Marilla and Karen I think are going to go into a bit further, it's a, if you're thinking about having a baby, it's a really good time for, the, for your family to consider the importance of weight management because it's important for mum's health. It influences the risk of gestational diabetes and preeclampsia and we think it's also going to be important for the baby in terms of increasing their predisposition to inflammation. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. And we'll take more questions for Peter at the end of the webinar. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Marilla Druitt is an obstetrician and gynaecologist with a special interest in pelvic pain. As a doctor, she trained in Melbourne, rural Victoria, Vietnam and Ireland and settled in Geelong because the medical system was so good. Marilla works in the public and private sector and is interested in public health, how to improve everyone's health so they start a pregnancy in good shape and with good knowledge. Over to you, Marilla. So, thanks, Yvette, and thanks to GMHBA and Tech for asking me to be a part of this. Um, so, actually, this is a different map from the one I've given, uh, but essentially, it's just to set the scene in that it's telling us about how many women die in association with pregnancy per head of population, and Australia is doing really pretty well. So even though we've got lots of suggestions, you know, I think we need to feel proud that we're part of a centralist medical system and outcomes are usually really good. Next theme. Um, we're going to go to a poll. So can I have the poll slide, please? Uh, so I'm interested to know what you guys think out there think is the risk factor that Australian pregnant women um, have that worries obstetricians and uh, midwives most in 2016. So is it smoking, alcohol, drugs, being overweight or listeria? So let me know. I'm now going to talk about 10 things that you can do during your pregnancy, before your pregnancy, uh, to make it as healthy as can be. So next slide. So the, the first no-brainer is obviously to stop smoking. So, ah, okay, here we go. Smoking, alcohol, drugs, overweight, listeria. Okay, that's good. So yes, they all matter. Um, and I'll tell you at the end which one I think worries us the most. Next slide. And so back, back to smoking. Um, so there are, in the last 15 years, the number of women who have smoking has been fantastic. And so maybe 10, 15% of pregnant women smoke in Australia. Uh, but we know that it can cause a baby who's too small for its genetic potential, which is no good. It ups the chance of having a stillbirth, miscarriage, clot in your leg, or a stroke, and no one needs a stroke when they're pregnant. So back to smoking. Um, <laughs> you could try quitting cold turkey, or with gum, or patches, or medicine, or hypnosis. And usually it takes people a couple of tries 
we know that if people get their help of a good their GP, then their chances of staying quick is much better. Um, but as I said, it can take a few tries. All right, now I can talk about good fruit and veggie intake, which Pete's already mentioned. Um, so prior to pregnancy, if you have your recommended intake, which is plenty, um, it's associated with a lower chance of having a small baby. And having a small baby might be, it might sound better, but it's not necessarily better for the baby. Um, and I think Karen's talking about this a bit more later. Next. Alcohol. So alcohol is a toxin, and especially to developing baby brains. It causes cancer too. Uh, so the safest thing for women to do when they are planning pregnancy or being pregnant or breastfeeding is actually not to drink any. Um, we don't know what amount is safe, so probably the safest is none, but it's such a huge part of Australian society that this can actually be very tricky for some people. Um, especially if you are trying to conceive and your friends notice that you're, dr you're not drinking and that can be uncomfortable. So you need a plan if you're going to try and conceive without everyone to. So you could tell everybody about the breast cancer risk. So drinking alcohol is associated with a higher breast cancer risk. So you know everyone wants to do fun runs and raise money, but actually everyone should just stop drinking alcohol. So that's somewhat unpalatable to our general society. Um, you could tell them that you don't like the empty calories, or you could just factor in a new way of thinking about alcohol not having to be part of every occasion. Next slide, please. Um, no, we had a, a question from a participant asking if coffee oh, is harmful during point. pregnancy. Sure. Um, I think that our current guidelines say that you're allowed a couple of cups of caffeinated beverages per day and you have to drink a lot of coffee for there to be a problem. So yeah, have a, have a daily coffee, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so immunisations, um, there's been some recent data out of Western Australia, which is fabulous, looking at flu vaccine in pregnant women and non and non vaccinated pregnant women. And the group who were pregnant who had their vaccines had a lower stillbirth rate than the group who were pregnant who didn't have the flu vaccine. So I know a lot of people worry about having immunisations in pregnancy, but this one is a good one. Um, Chickenpox, uh, sorry, whooping cough. Um, so whooping cough is a bacterial disease that makes babies cough and cough and cough and then some of them used to die. And in fact, some of them still do. So we used to try a cocooning strategy, which was to offer mums and dads and aunts and uncles and grandparents a vaccination so that when the baby was born, it would be protected. But that didn't work so well. So now we offer all pregnant women at 28 weeks a booster so that she makes antibodies, they transfer through the placenta so that the baby's born protected for that first six weeks of life where it doesn't have a vaccine yet. And then breast milk will also give them some more antibodies. So flu, whooping cough, chickenpox. About 5% of women um, have not been exposed to chickenpox in the past. And if you catch it when you're pregnant, that's no fun. You're more likely to end up with pneumonia. And if it's at a crucial time in pregnancy, maybe about 1% or 2% of babies will end up with some sort of problem with skin scars or arms and leg problems or vision problems. And we've got a vaccine for it. So if you had pre-pregnancy blood and you are not immune to rubella, then go and have a vaccine. Finally, rubella. So rubella is dear to the hearts of Australian doctors. It was a Sydney ophthalmologist who worked out that the kids, the babies who were seen with cataracts, um, being born with a congenital eye problem, their mums had had rubella when they were pregnant. And so there has been a fabulously successful campaign in Australia and all around the world uh, to vaccinate kids and teenagers at school. And now we hardly ever see congenital rubella. But around the world, maybe 100,000 Babies are born every year with congenital rubella syndrome. And again, if you have a low level in your pre-pregnancy blood or none, then you can have a vaccine. And then hopefully you don't catch it. Next slide, please. So a few other pre-pregnancy bloods are to check to make sure that you don't have hepatitis B or hepatitis C. And these are two liver viruses which can cause liver failure and cancer. Uh, both of these can be treated if needs be. Um, we've got a vaccine to hep B, and some of you might have heard that we've got a new uh, drug on the PBS to treat hepatitis B, which is very exciting. Um, HIV, thanks to the Grim Reaper campaign of the 1980s and the fact that Australians were brave enough to talk about condoms and STIs, the chance of me finding somebody with HIV in pregnancy is about 1 in 20,000. Uh, but 
still the stats people tell us that it's still cost effective because we can then prevent by treating the mother transmission to the baby so that the baby doesn't end up with HIV. Syphilis, an oldie but a goodie, but it's a sexually transmitted infection which makes babies grow badly and you can fix it with some penicillin. So it'd be nice to know about that before pregnancy. It's not very common in, a, in the southern half of Australia, but it's still for all of the reasons of HIV, still in the gamut of tests that we offer pregnant women and also pre-pregnancy in screening because uh, we've got it's a cheap test, it's easy to do, and it's still worthwhile and the consequences are not so fantastic. Uh, we would like to know your blood group and whether or not you've got any antibodies against red blood cell components. And then finally, what your blood count is, so your haemoglobin that needs iron to transport oxygen around the body. So when you are pregnant, your baby will merrily steal all of your iron, and so starting off at a good level is helpful. Folates, iodine, and calcium uh, are very important, as I'm sure you're all, uh, as I'm sure you know. Uh, folates helps decrease the risk of cyanobacteria, which is where nerves don't grow properly in the baby. Uh, Iodine, which you can find in lots and lots of asparagus or seaweed, uh, is good for thyroid function because babies don't make their own thyroid hormone until about 12 weeks. And calcium is good to decrease the chance of preeclampsia. So preeclampsia, as Pete was saying, is a is the most common disease of pregnancy. It's unique to humans. About 10% of women having their first baby get some form of it. Usually, it's high blood pressure and kidneys leaking protein in the urine and you know, this is one of the major reasons why we have our pregnancy day stay and uh, antenatal care, really. So about 70% of women don't have enough calcium in their diet, and you can get calcium through lots of things, such as uh, dairy and soy and fish bones and not. And if you don't have enough, your preeclampsia chance is higher. So usually we would recommend a supplement for folate and iodine, and you can get them as a combined tablet. But for calcium, probably food is better. Right. Next slide. All right, avoid, avoid foods which might have listeria. So when you're pregnant, there's a whole long list of foods that you're not supposed to eat, and it seems quite draconian, and Australia has slightly different rules to other countries, but you've got to play by the rules. So listeria is a bacteria that can cause miscarriage and stillbirth, and it's found in contaminated food products, such as things you get from a deli, salami, soft serve, sushi, and you know the list is as long as your arm and sometimes you feel like all you can eat are Vegemite sandwiches. But we are never going to be able to get good data of pregnant women, you group, you go and eat all of these foods and we'll see what happens to you versus you follow the rules and we'll compare. So we're stuck with this for the moment. Next. And almost there. Number eight on the list of things to do. Um, be your most healthy weight. So this is a BMI chart, which is what Pete was talking about. And in Australia, maybe about half of women are now overweight or have a BMI over 30 when they first conceive. Um, so even at a BMI of 30, the chance of ending up with a seizure is about 47%, or the and the chance of having a stillbirth is higher, which is something that's very difficult to talk to people about when they are meeting for the first time at 10 weeks. But so you know, preparation is the key. Um, something else we would like to know more about is how much weight to put on during pregnancy. And we think that the less that you put on, the easier it is to get back to your normal pregnancy weight. But we're not sure yet about how that can change outcomes during that current pregnancy. Next. Medical problems, get them under control before you get pregnant. So if you've got type 2 diabetes, the better you control, the better things will end up. And if you've had mental health problems in the past, having a mental health checkup is important. And then finally, number 10, we have I'm not sure whose phone is ringing. No, it's not mine. Um, this one, which is from the Victorian uh, Clinical Genetics Service, and it's looking for a problem with your genes. So are you a carrier of something that you and your partner might end up giving to your baby? So this is not everyone's cup of tea, but for example, the cystic fibrosis community feel really strongly that people know about this that it exists before they are pregnant. So just say you're both carriers of cystic fibrosis, which is a lung disease that you know can shorten your life expectancy. Maybe if it was a perfect world, maybe you'd both go off and have IVF 
test the embryos and put the one back in that didn't have the problem. And next. So when you are pregnant or when you get there, uh, sometimes people choose one care provider, sometimes people choose a combination and they all have different things to offer and they're appropriate for different situations and sometimes different philosophies about the different levels of intervention that are required to achieve whatever outcome you're after. But essentially everybody wants a healthy mother and a healthy baby uh, and everyone benefits from women asking questions and a good close collaboration with their health provider. Next. I think this is my second last slide. What can dads do? Um, or partners, because um, they're not all dads. Um, get a hooping cough booster. That's really easy. Often you haven't, uh, fathers haven't, or partners haven't had a booster since they were at school, and your immunity can wane over time. Stop smoking and stop alcohol so you have good sperm. Check your mental health. So maybe about 25% of dads in some uh, studies that have been done end up with postnatal depression. And so if you don't have a GP, get a GP. And if your mental health is not that good, then get onto it now and don't wait for it to all go downhill. Finally, and I feel really strongly about this, this is not from any college or particular guideline, but pregnant women use a lot of blood. And we don't pay our donors in Australia. Um, and it costs a lot to um, produce one unit, so it's maybe about $700. And there is some data to suggest that if a fit young man donates blood, he lives longer. So that's a winner. So if you've got nothing else to do when your partner is pregnant, then maybe going and donating it would be helpful. So finally, last slide. Just back to that math. So despite all this maybe doom and gloom, we are doing pretty well. So uh, it all needs to be taken in context. Thanks. I think we've got Karen up next. Thank you, Marilla gives you a bit of perspective. Right, now Karen Binks is an accredited exercise physiologist and nutritionist with more than 20 years experience in her profession. She loves to, in, uh, to share the joy of moving. Karen specialises in the prescription of physical activity to assist in the management of a multitude of health related issues. Karen's extended working background includes group exercise facilitation with a strong focus on yoga and Pilates instruction, nursing, mental health and health education. Karen studied classical ballet for 11 years from the age of 7 to 18 and loves to dance. She's also a self-confessed nerd with a passion for increasing her knowledge of the human body and how to improve health. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Yvette. Um, I just have to thank GMHBA and say how excited I am to be here and, and honoured to be here. And where I'd like to start is just discussing what an exercise physiologist actually is because I think there's many, many people that don't actually know that we exist. Um, there's not many of us in Geelong actually, it's probably only a, a handful. Uh, but I just thought I'd start by explaining what an exercise physiologist is. So on your screen there it says, you know, exercise physiologist, we're university qualified and we provide specialist prescription of physical activity and movement for the prevention and management of chronic disease and injuries. The other thing that a lot of people don't realise is that often exercise physiologists are dual qualified. So many EPs are you know, qualified as diabetes educators or, or dietitians or physios. So we, we often have really broad ranging qualifications and then on top of that, like myself, I teach a lot of group exercise. I love working with groups and I love to share my passion of movement. So, yeah, encouraging people to move as much as possible. Could I have the next slide, please? So just expanding on that, what does an accredited exercise physiologist do and help with? So, again, on your screen, I'm not going to go through all of those. You can read them for yourself, I'm sure. But there's many things that we can help with. So, yeah, um, with respect to pregnancy, one of the areas that we're, or pre-pregnancy, post-pregnancy, we do help you know, in those areas with exercise prescription and advice with uh, physical activity recommendations. So one of the things that we're, we're really, really keen to do is encourage women 
pre-pregnancy to actually you know, move as much as they can. And that we're designed to move. So the more we can encourage people to move, the better. I'd just like to, to stop here and actually ask um, for the, my poll to be put up. And I, what I'd really like to know is, is how long our participants spend in sitting. So if you could actually just take a, a moment to answer this question for me. How long would you spend per day in sitting? Because we know that, uh, that people that spend long time in sitting can have you know, health related issues. So I'm just waiting for those results to come in. And the poll's still in progress. Oh, there we go. So, awesome. So I've got no one that sits for more than 10 hours. That's fantastic because with the research is now showing that, that you know, we are sitting for a lot longer in our day than we need to. The recommendations are actually you know, less than an hour a day in uninterrupted sitting. So you know, if we can get that focus across that it's not just about going to the gym or, or doing um, you know, 30 minutes a day, which is what the, uh, the recommendations are. If I, if I can have the next slide, please, and we can actually discuss that. So we have uh, recommendations for our physical activity. So I've given you activity guidelines for um, Australians, and we've actually just recently added to those guidelines sedentary behaviour guidelines as well. So we'll just work through these. So it's really important to get across the message that any activity is better than doing none. So I know a lot of people think, oh, I can only go for a walk today. It doesn't matter. Just, just get out there and do it. We are designed to move and we need to encourage and promote movement you know, across the board for anyone. Um, can I go back to that previous slide, please, <laughs> just, just momentarily? Oh, thank you. So be active as much as you can. Accumulate at 150 to 300, and 300 minutes of exercise on a, on a daily basis. Strengthen muscles as well. And then, as you can see there, there are recommendations for sedentary behaviour. So minimising the amount of time spent in sitting and break up your sitting. Now if I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So these are some practical tips. And you know, in, in my day-to-day -day work as an exercise physiologist, these are the things I say to people on a very regular basis. So reduce, reduce the time spent in uninterrupted sitting. If you do have to sit for extended periods of time, get up, get down, move around get on the floor, do some push-ups, whatever it takes, if you can do push-ups of course, um, don't sit still for extended periods of time. Find more opportunities to move in your day, especially at work and at home. Wear a pedometer, so a lot of people now are wearing pedometers to um, see how many steps they do do in a day or an activity tracker. Um, and we are encouraging people to do about 10,000 steps a day. And it's really interesting to see when, you, when people start wearing an activity tracker that they are really surprised to see how little they can actually move. Use active transport, so ride a bike, walk to work, um, maybe use a skateboard, but maybe that's not so good if you're pregnant. Um, park a little bit further away and yeah, take up the opportunity to have a look at those Australian physical activity guidelines um, on, on the internet. So if I can have the next slide, please. So coming back to the concept of reducing sedentary behaviour, if we can actually encourage people to, again, move more, this is uh, also information from the Australian Physical Activity Guidelines, just encouraging more movement in your day. And one of the, the major problems is television watching. So um, maybe we could actually start encouraging people to stand up, and I'm really impressed to see that Peter's standing, or I assume he's standing. Um, He's smiling, yes, obviously he's standing, which is great. <laughs> um, and, and I stand when I'm, when I'm working with, in my clinic, when I'm working at home, I try and stand as much as I can. So we know that when people stand up, you're using the really big muscles in the body, so the, the quads, the hamstrings, the glutes, and the core, they're all working to actually burn more calories, and there's, there's other evidence around the benefits of standing that go beyond just just calorie burning. Uh, so again, take, take the time to have a look at the Australian Physical Activity Guidelines and get a feel for what's actually, you know, what those recommendations are. So 
So if I can have the next slide, please. It's coming up. Uh, as a parent, I do have two children, and I you know, very, very you know, strongly promote my children moving and exercising and being as physically active as they can. I did have a lot of opportunities to take my children to the park and would often see mum at the park sitting down, focusing on their phone, so texting and whatever while their kids are, are playing. And I, I just love that image there of the dad sitting there swinging his child with a, with a rope, um, sitting down having a glass of brown lemonade. It, it is really important that you get out there and role model and show your children and play with them and run around with them and, and use your, your body to encourage them how to learn to use their bodies. I can have the next slide, please. Karen, I've got a question from Emma asking, if you are not very active before your pregnancy and you fall pregnant, pregnant what would you recommend for activity during your pregnancy? Ah, that's a great question and it's a, it's a really common question. Uh, yeah, I think there is a bit of a myth that you know, if you are not active before you got pregnant that you shouldn't exercise at all. Um, yeah, the, the best place to start is to, if you're not sure, find some advice. So speak to an exercise physiologist, speak to a personal trainer, make sure your personal trainer's got really good quality knowledge. Walking is the best place to start and you know, everyone's different. So this slide that's up at the moment the, would probably be a very good place to start. On the uh, exerciseright.com.au website, there is a, an exercise quiz and it will ask you to add in you know, a whole range of parameters around you know, height, weight, physical activity levels, um, date of birth, that sort of stuff that you can plug into this quiz and it will actually give you uh, recommendations for where to exercise, who to get exercise recommendations from, when to exercise, when it's better to exercise in the morning or at night. And what, what this quiz actually does is, is what I do, is that, you know, promoting uh, individualisation because every person is different. So not one exercise program is going to fit everyone. So getting, you know, good individual advice is, you know, what I'd recommend. But, you know, again, answering that question, starting with walking um, and then, you know, taking it from there. So if I can have the next slide, please. So we talked about physical activity and just some general guidelines around physical activity. It's also important to you know, sort of at least address diet and oh, interesting noise in the background. Um, just promoting, sorry, I've got distracted by that noise. I'll come back. Coming back to you know, eating, eating really well. So I think just like exercise, most people know what they should eat. Um, most people know what they should do from a physical activity perspective as well, but it's, it's finding the motivation and it's getting, getting some guidance. So the Australian, the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating um, at eatforhealth.gov.au provides some really clear guidelines around just general dietary advice. But from a more practical perspective, if we can go to the next slide, please. Coming up now. Some of the things I, I you know, talk to, about with my clients is how to eat well. And they're really, really practical things. Like, make sure you eat mindfully. Try not to eat on the run. So how many of us, you know, I'm looking out the window right now and I can see people walking by eating their sandwiches and, you know, going from place to place. So eating while we're in the car, you know, throwing the kids some takeaway as we're driving wherever we're going. Um, it's so much more important to be able to encourage people to eat mindfully. Sit down and think about what you're eating and, and eat carefully and, and take notice of what you're eating. So you get the opportunity to know when you've had enough. Take notice of your portion sizes and portion sizes have really got out of control um, over the last few years. So coming back to eating off a smaller plate and that's where sitting down at meal times and actually eating with the family or even by yourself, it's important to put your food on a plate so you can actually see how much you're eating. Whereas if you just keep going back and picking at, you know, at the, the pantry, you really don't have much of an idea of how much you're eating. 
So eat your family meals at the table and turn off electronic devices. How many families sit down on the couch and eat their dinner and don't really think about what they're eating? Other important things to do, mapping out a weekly meal plan and using your meal plan to create your shopping list. So you know exactly what you need to have in the cupboard. So then you don't have the excuse of, oh, I didn't have anything in the cupboard to eat, so I just bought some takeaway, or I just decided to have a Vegemite sandwich, or whatever. Watching out for non-hungry eating. This is a, a really important point. Uh, we eat often for the wrong reasons. So I eat because I'm sad, I eat because I'm depressed, I eat because I just had a fight with my husband, I eat because the, the children are driving me mad. So using food as a way of soothing yourself rather than using food as a way of uh, in, improving your health or providing you with energy. Limiting the amount of takeaway and processed foods, eating fresh wherever possible and again coming back to those Australian dietary guidelines that we looked at, at on the previous slide. So if I can have the next slide, please. There are, at, on that website, eatforhealth.gov.au, recommend, recommendations for pregnancy. And most of, the, well, most of the things that Marilla talked about are in those guidelines, but they are readily accessible as PDFs. We can download, download them off the internet um, if you're interested in those. And... I think I've got one more slide, so if I can have the next slide, please. Or is that, oh, that's it, I'm done. So I'll hand back to Yvette. Thank you, Karen. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, I, I think there was, there was one more point that, that came to me as I was driving here, which is you know, the way my brain operates, is that we need to start to get to know our bodies a little bit more. I think from a, both a physical activity and a, a food intake perspective, we're so busy thinking about all the other stuff that goes on in our world that we really don't know our bodies. And you know, people ask me, what sort of exercise is the best sort of, ex sort of exercise to do? If you really took the time to stop and think about your body and how it works, you probably know, or in, intuitively, you might know. Now, that, it, it, I, I think having taken that opportunity to stop, take a big deep breath and really think about this amazing piece of equipment that we walk around with every day. Like as the human body is amazing and you know, getting to know it you know, very, on a very you know, familiar level is you know, to me a really important point. So I might stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear your passion. I love it. Now, it's time to take some questions. <laughs> it's time to take some questions from our audience. So, Anna, do our audience want to know anything particular from our wonderful presenters? Yes, so I do have a couple of questions. Um, straight away, I might just ask Marilla if you can just discuss the results from the poll question of which risk factor raises the most concern for health professionals for pregnant women, if that's possible. Sure, can we go back to the results or not? I think 40% of people said... Yeah, unable to go back to those. 40% said that they were... Well, the majority said they, were, they thought that we were most worried about smoking, which is actually not true anymore. So the public health campaigns in Australia have been fantastic and plain packaging legislation and a whole raft of different... Uh, attempts to try and decrease smoking has is working basically, um, and so we're not so worried about that anymore. So the the problem is weight. So people who are overweight are the ones who worry us the most. So yes, um, it's really risky being pregnant and trying to have a baby if you're 150 kilos. But actually, the burden of disease or the the thing that sort of shifts the curve is not people who are at that extreme of weight. It's the people in the sort of the BMI of 30 who think that they should be able to have a vaginal birth without any help and it's all going fabulously, but actually they end up with a whole heap more intervention and they might not realise that they're in that higher risk group. So the healthier the weight you can get to before you conceive, the better. The less weight that you put on when you're pregnant, the better. Um, obviously don't start doing triathlons if you haven't done them before. Um, and and having realistic expectations about what might happen I think is really important. So you're more likely to be happy if you 
are feeling lucky that you end up with a vaginal birth, I think, than if your birth plan has been torn to shreds. Wonderful. We've got another question from Karen. She would like to know, um, because she wasn't aware that she was pregnant at the start, she did have quite a few drinks and she's wondering, will that affect her baby's health, um, even if she has stopped drinking now? So this is actually an exam question when I was doing my membership exam um, of somebody who's had a you know, glass of champagne when they're seven weeks or so. I think the public health message of not drinking in pregnancy is an attempt again to shift the curve. So fetal alcohol syndrome is a problem with baby brains and a whole raft of other things. And yes, it's easier to see a correlation when people drink huge amounts, but it happens at at smaller amounts too, and because we don't know what people can get away with, it's better if everyone doesn't. Having said that, I'll mostly, uh, you know, having a couple of drinks around five weeks and you don't know you're pregnant yet, mostly we can't measure that anything bad happens, happens because of that. We're never going to be able to get our best data of, okay, you drink this much and we'll see what happens to your baby, and you don't drink and we'll prepare you. Um, but probably genetics are more important at that point than environmental stimuli. But I think we don't know. Hey, what, what do you reckon? Well, I was going to actually ask you, what, um, what's the point at which um, embryonic implantation occurs? Day five. So, day five. So it's pretty early on, isn't it? So I think if yeah. you... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with what Marilla says. Uh, I think as a, there's, a, there's a sort of a, a distinction between what you might say in a public health message and how you can apply that information to an individual. So the public health message needs to be that the safest thing to do is not have any alcohol during pregnancy. Having yep. said that, there are plenty of babies who are exposed to some level of alcohol intake during pregnancy and have nothing that we can measure to show for it. So I don't think you need to be, you know, overly um, stressed about having had some level of alcohol exposure in, in early pregnancy. Um, and I don't, but I don't think anyone's going to be able to give you an absolutely sort of ironclad answer to that question. It's, mm. it's, it's yeah. there is a sort of. There, I think the main thing is to distinguish between the public health message, which has to be conservative and say, you know, well, we can't say that there's no harm associated with um, with very low levels. Nor can we really say that there is harm associated with very low levels. Um, it's just that the safest. You know, the precautionary principle says that that's the public health message. But for the individual, you know, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. I think it's, you know, the, if it's early in, if it's not, if it's sort of, you know, not really sustained heavy alcohol use, then, um, you know, the chance of there being anything that's obvious is really, really small. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, one other question. This will be both to Marilla and Karen, I believe, that participants would like to know, what would you recommend, what are the exercises you would recommend to prepare for a safe and a healthy birth? Karen, do you want to go first? Good question. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give it a crack. Uh, there are, it, like, that, that, that's like the question of how long is a piece of string. It, it is going to be, need to be individualised. Uh, so, but the things that probably are going to help the most is to have a strong cardiovascular system. So, you know, doing aerobic activity that's going to, you know, stimulate the, the cardiovascular system, heart and lungs to be stronger. Uh, we'd also like to see, you know, women have, you know, stronger core stability. So, you know, in, you know, working on, you know, the bigger muscles like the glutes, the, the you know, working on pelvic floor, working on you know the, the the core muscles of the body to make sure that the the incidence of lower back pain is reduced. Um, they're the areas that I would probably think. What do you, what do you think, Marilla? Where would you go? Yeah, so being fit so that you can cope with labour and you bounce back faster. That's really important. Yep. Uh, pelvic floor so that you don't end up with a leaky mm -hmm. bladder or that your recovery is faster. I like the idea yep. of making sure that you do head and neck and shoulder exercises so that if you're going to be spending a lot of time feeding a baby with your head down that you don't suddenly get a whole new set of 
muscle problem. It's all about moving. Yeah. So the more you do, the better. And that, yeah. And if I can come back to that concept of trying not to sit so much, because we know the 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 muscles that become switched off and not used enough in sitting are those back muscles. So you know, sitting for extended periods of time in front of a computer or in front of a television switches off those big big muscles that we need to be able to use to hold ourselves upright and hold your neck and shoulders up. So that's a really good point. Okay, wonderful. One last question for Karen. Um, I'll combine a couple of questions together. Uh, a few participants okay. are wondering, what are the safest options for cardio exercises in terms of when your stomach is growing and it's getting in the way? Um, so yes. should cycling, running, and how much exercise per day in terms of minutes would you recommend? I'll come to timing first. Uh, that's going to again be individualised. You know, if we stick with the the guidelines that are based on research, a minimum of 30 minutes. You know, on most days of the week, um, it does depend on on how they're coping. So, you know, for, again, from a looking at intensity as well, not just how long, but how hard. You know, we'd probably be wanting to use a heart rate monitor to, to monitor how the, the heart, the cardiovascular system is responding to the activity. So coming back to what type of exercise, it is again going to be individualised depending on the person. Riding a bike is going to be very difficult because um, sitting on a bike with a, a, you know, a very large belly, I've experienced it. It's, it, it can be done, but it's, it's not that comfortable. And it might not be the, be the best positioning from a, a spinal, pelvic, you know, postural perspective to actually be sitting on a bike with a big belly. Um, Walking is obviously going to be fantastic. Um, I've worked with women that, that were runners before they got pregnant and managed to continue to run, although they did start to slow down. Um, during their, their pregnancy. So, yeah, running would be fine. Swimming is fantastic, um, depending on, again, whether you've been a swimmer beforehand or not. They're probably the, the recommended. So, swimming, cycling, walking, running, the basics. Wonderful. Thank you, Karen. I'm just mindful of time, okay. so I'm just going to ask Peter one question. Um, does this does the Bowen Infant Study include looking at microbiome of babies born vaginally versus cesarean? Good question. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, so and we can certainly we've we've begun looking at the the microbiome of the babies um, in their looking in their poo samples at one month of age, and we can certainly see differences between babies born. Uh, vaginally versus via elective or, or emergency cesarean section, and that's these are you know re reproducing findings that others have have um, published before us. Um, what the significance of that is yet, I think, remains to be determined. There's there's a sense out there that mode of birth is very strongly associated with a whole range of health health outcomes for the baby. Actually, the data is nowhere near as compelling as people think it might be. So, whilst there's some evidence that babies born by a cesarean section might be at um, higher risk of some immune-related outcomes. It's a little bit. Um, it's not. It's not completely consistent evidence, and it's often not been well divided up in terms of um, elective cesarean section versus emergency cesarean section. And certainly in the asthma field, for example, it looks like a lot of that association is driven by the emergency cesarean sections, which makes you wonder: well, is it the cesarean section? or is it the, the, the thing that led to the emergency caesarean section? So for example, preeclampsia um, appears to be associated with immune outcomes in the baby. So yes, we are looking at it and we do think it's important, um, but I don't, it's not quite as simple nor as strong a single signal as I think people um, have, have a perspective it that it may be. And I think that's important because a lot of women need for very good reasons to have caesarean sections and um, I wouldn't want them to think well that's it you know we've, we've really messed with the child's microbiome and they're in trouble now because I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. Okay wonderful thank you Peter. I might pass it on to Yvette. 
I'm just looking at the time, but thank you everyone for your questions. Thanks, thank Anna. You. We now need to finish up. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters, <laughs> Peter, Marilla and Karen. The wealth of knowledge in this webinar has been fantastic and thank you to our audience. We hope you found this information valuable and enjoyable as I did. If you need more information, then um, feel free to contact the Bowen Infant Study or GMHBA. Um, and we'd really love your feedback. So you'll get an, an email with a survey when, you, um, when this webinar finishes and we would really appreciate your time filling this out. It won't take you long. Thank you everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. See you later.